So let me briefly introduce our, our panel. Uh, the subject of this panel is on uh, local government and innovation districts. Um, I think this panel is in many ways a continuation of a discussion uh, we had, and it seems like a week ago, but I believe it was only yesterday, um, about the role of government in, uh, in innovation and uh, economic policy. Um, what we're going to discuss is, is, uh, is not a question whether government has a role in innovation. It is a explanation of how local governments uh, are uh, fulfilling an important function within the economy in relationship to universities and business. And uh, for me, the um, sort of the genesis of this was a conference I attended in uh, Boston that uh, Kyle Polk and I both attended last winter in which I suddenly realized that a situation that my country is in is that it has a national government that is paralyzed and unable to do anything. It has regional governments that are too afraid to do anything. And it has uh, local cities who have to do something yeah. because of their uh, relationship to the population. And as we put this uh, panel together, we realize that in, this is a common theme. Cities have relationship to real people and population, and they have to solve problems. So the focus of this panel will be on how different cities uh, are solving uh, real problems of economic growth. And I uh, uh, want to say that we are the only panel in which there's no academic rec recommend, uh, represented here on stage. So um, I, I am hoping you won't uh, look down on us for that. Um, and I'm also hoping that we can give you some more things to think about. And if we're able to uh, hold ourselves to our time limits, then we will have some time for you to comment and for questions. Um, so with that introduction, uh, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, and uh, who we're very, very happy to have with us, the distinguished uh, Joseph Piquet, who is the CEO of the Office of Economic Growth of Barcelona City Council, president and also president of the European Division of International Association of Science Parks and Areas of Innovation in Spain. And he is going to talk to us about how Spain, I mean, sorry, how Barcelona is co coping with the future and positioning itself to be a city of the future. So okay. thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, good. Uh, first, uh, let me clap again the organizers, because uh, Henry Etzkovic and his team and also the local organizers were doing a wonderful job because we are together sharing our knowledge, sharing our experience, sharing our results of academics, and really clap again. The last clap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no. Okay, uh, let me tell you that I am now working as a policy maker, but uh, Henry knows uh, that I was uh, in, a, in my past, and I am on leave of the university, La Salle University, and I was working, developing a technology park, uh, all about incubators, and we were analyzing together the Silicon Valley, trying to understand what's the role of the public administration in the Silicon Valley, and we discovered that there's no role. <laughs> that's good, that's good, because we have to do the research in order to find it. And the agenda for today, I will divide in, really, I will use a lot of time in the framework, because this is a triple helix meeting, and I would like to show you how we are using the theories in order to apply policy making in the cities. And I will develop how Barcelona is developing these uh, theories and how it's promoting the, an innovation district that is 20 to add. First, we are in a revolution of the cities for different reasons. First, because the 50% of the population of the world is, are living in cities, in Europe the 70%, and it's expecting that in two, uh, 2050 we we'll have more than 70% of the population of the world living in cities. The cities are the challenge of the world are the problems of the world, but also are the solutions of the world and for the world. Solutions in terms of pollution, solutions in terms of food, in terms of inclusive growth, or whatever. But in the middle of that, and I agree with you that this center is about cities, 
uh, the last century was about nations, two centuries ago was, was about empires. And it's about cities, but not cities isolated, cities connected, connected with their citizens, but also with another cities. cities. And we are now in an incredible revolution of internet, because until now you know that the first revolution that all our things will be in the cloud, music, uh, videos and whatever, the documents. The second revolution is the internet of the social relationships. It's all, ab all about Twitter and Facebook and so on. But the third revolution in is internet of everything, everything. It means that we will connect all the things to the cloud and it means for, for the cities we have the opportunities to transform our cities in an, uh, smart cities. Why? Because until now we had uh, water solutions, uh, weight solutions, energy solutions, mobility solutions, and we had to manage the city providing these services to the citizens. But now, if all the services that in a vertical way are talking IP, internet protocol, they can make dialogues and they can make decisions to open a uh, traffic line because a uh, fireman needs a green line uh, in order to find uh, the fire, or uh, connecting uh, the different systems that the city has. This is important because it means that we have to do innovation. And that's the reason why the city needs innovation, needs application of the results of the research and technology, but it needs this to solve the challenge of the citizens and the challenge of the city. But the more interesting thing is that we have another sensor, the more sophisticated sensor that we have never had until now, is the citizen. The citizen with the mobile will interact with reality, will use the data, open data to make their own decisions and will provide to the rest of the citizens information that they can share. This is also important because it means evolution of the innovation. We have to include the citizen at the beginning of the process of innovation. But this is about cities, and we can buy all the technology, I don't know where, and we can apply in our city, and that's, I have my uh, smart city. This is not about buying. This is about learning. This is about learning process. Because at the end of the day, the city is a goal of innovation, but also the city is a platform for innovation. When Lloyd Lester uh, was talking about the role of the location, the place, is that the city is also a platform for the knowledge-based economy. And why? Because we know that in the city we have researchers, we have universities, and they are living in our cities. And until now, the city managers were managing shopping, were managing tourism, and no more. And now they have to manage innovation. They have to manage value chains. They have to manage clusters. They have to manage the knowledge-based economy. They have to manage the raw material of the knowledge-based economy that at the end of the day is the talent. That's the connection. The citizens are the talent. The cities are the platform for the talent. The cities are the platform for the knowledge-based economy. In this way, triple helix means that we know that we had in the cities, we had during centuries cities, in the cities, universities that were in the city, living there, but we were carrying or managing as a city managers, uh, cleaning the streets and be sure that we have light at night. This is not about the relation of the city, the city managers with the universities. We know that we can create a public private partnership platform. We can work together, but more than that, understanding in the, what means triple helix, creating hybrid organizations, creating science park, creating innovation district, creating all about clusters, creating how to work together and creating governance, creating the way that we work together, we share the vision, we manage the day by day, and we decide what projects we work together. And the more interesting thing about cities is that nothing is local. Now all is global. Our citizens wants to want to be as a global citizens and they choose our city if they can feel global citizens if we don't provide the environment if we don't provide the ecology that they can really be global we will lose or more than that 
the citizens that will not leave our cities because they cannot live. This is a challenge of the freedom of the citizens. We have to create a freedom, but we have to provide the freedom. And also, we have to be sure that our cities are connected with the science in a global perspective. Science is global for definitions in the technology because we can scale what we do in the city in order to do in another cities. It means that technology is a good way for the scalability of the technology. We have to be sure that our companies are selling products to the world. And the more interesting thing is that square. We have to be sure that our city is a place for learning locally in order to compete globally. This is, it means that the local demand is a global competitive advantage. If we buy in an innovative way, if we adopt innovation, if we accept innovation, if we allow innovation, it means a change in the way of managing the reality because at the end of the day, it means that the demand side is stimulating all the value chain. If we put here the challenge of the cities, we will put here the sophisticated demand. In this way, this is about cities, but believe me that the big corporations, Cisco, IBM, and so on, are really trying to understand what is happening in cities, and they are opening the door of innovation, and they are looking for any innovation in the world. It is a good innovation. It means that we have to be ready as a cities, as a platform for innovation, to say to the big corporations that we are ready, our ecology is ready, and tell Cisco, I have 100 entrepreneurs ready to develop new proposals. And this is interesting because open innovation is in big corporations, and we as a cities, we must be a connectors of the global innovation system. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about big corporations, it's about the connection of the new corporations with the big corporations. And sometimes the new corporations, they don't know how to grow. Why? Because they don't know what is the exit plan. My proposal to that is be sure that the first day they know the exit plan, because the venture capital will be here, don't worry. But if they don't know the exit plan, nobody will invest in them. My proposal is be sure that the big corporations, and now they are going down, they are going down because they are uh, spending or they're investing tickets of 500,000 euros, 1 million euros. It means that there is a cross connection between the new and the big. But also there is a, a big opportunity for the new entrepreneurs to grow in a fast way. The problem of the entrepreneurs is that sometimes they don't grow, they don't die, and they have a lifestyle company. But this is not a growth economy. This is about a specialization, a smart specialization, in what sectors I want to play in the world. Europe is asking, in Europe 2020, there's research and innovation strategy for a smart specialization. It means we have to choose in what sectors we want to play in the world, because remember that we are in a global world. And also, at the end of the day, it's about the creation of, of an ecology of innovation. We were talking in a workshop before. A college of innovation that is coming from our path dependency and is going to our vision. This is the two elements that we have to be sure that we are just putting in place the different agents. And also remembering that the citizens, the talent, is looking for a good place for working, but also a good place for living. That's the reason why the cities became the center of the knowledge-based economy, because it's the platform that is providing a good place for working, but also a good place for living. At the end of the day, 24 hours, seven days proposal, not just from nine to five, from Monday to Friday. This is a challenge for the cities, to allow the citizens to be citizens all the day. And just let me, let me touch of the framework. It's about talent. Richard Floyd is about talent and the flight class and the creative class and the 3% of the world. But what about the 97% of our population that is not the flight class? We must be sure that we are managing talent. At the end of the day, the cities will be a place for the talent and we have to be sure that the city sends, uh, and the city mayor and the city, uh, uh, the policy makers are managing the talent. It means allowing the social elevators, allowing the people to grow, attracting and 
managing the reception, the landing of international people, and developing a strategy of talent. In this case, uh, Barcelona. How many of you did you visit Barcelona in your life? Uh, good. The rest, I invite you to visit <laughs> Barcelona. Okay. Uh, you know that we are in the Mediterranean Sea, and we have a district that was planned 150 years ago. Uh, for, uh, it's a urban planning. For, for, we were connecting the old Barcelona with a small towns around. A wonderful moment with the textile industry, with some pollution, with some difficulties because we had big factories. And at the end of the 60s, 70s, we had this kind of degradation. Why? As all the cities, the companies were not comfortable, this kind of companies in the cities, we were inviting them to be out, and we saw this kind of old factories, plenty of nothing. It was a problem, economical problem, but also a social problem. And we had to do something. We were taking advantage of the Olympics, creating the, the rings around the city, and also some extra activities, uh, urban activities, but we had 100 blocks in the city center with this situation, and we decided to send a clear message. We want to preserve the knowledge-based industry. The industry, but now knowledge-based. Why? Because we want to be the platform for the talent, but platform for talent for living and working. It means that we could change all these areas of housing, but where the people can work. And if they only can work, the other people can live. It means that we were changing the urban plan, and we were understanding that we had to create a smart city that was a platform for the knowledge economy and the knowledge society in both sides. It's not just economy, it's also society. It's society and economy in both sides. And understanding that we had to put the hard factors ready for the soft factors in order to develop economy, it means attraction of companies and entrepreneurs, and also attraction of talent and the creation of the new generation of talent. In this case, you will see that we were combining companies, and near the companies, the universities, uh, also uh, the infrastructures, green infrastructures is about sustainability, and the mobility plan, but believe me that the mobility plan is one of the challenges that, that every city has, but the best mobility is the no mobility. It's when the people is living and working in a walking distance. It's not just because you have a highways connecting the housing with the place where they, they, they work. It's about housing and also about quality of life. It's about public space. It's about commons. It's about where the people really feel that they are living together. Uh, in this case, the smart city is a, of Barcelona is really a big transformation, four million square meters. Uh, if you are interested, I can tell you the investment, the return of investment, but let me tell you that we were investing 200 million, and now every year we have 20 million euros of taxes, local taxes, permanent taxes. And we, uh, with 200 million, we were moving 2,500 million euros of real estate investment. It means that with the public money, in the right moment, you can really move the privates. And uh, it was the way that we were inviting the privates to increase the floor, but asking them the 30% of the land, because we didn't have land. With this land, we were de doing new rent green spaces, we were doing housing, and we were giving part of this land to the universities. And the real backbone of the smart cities the infrastructures, these infrastructures at the end of the day are the way that we are learning how to create the new city, but the more interesting thing is that we were learning how to do new things. And we were allowing the entrepreneurs to do things in the district. More than that, we were giving the opportunity to use our city as a lab. This is the challenge of every city. It's not just what you are doing now, it's how you are doing that how you are involving, how you are allowing innovation, new deal flow of innovation. That's the reason why I am sharing with you this slide because this is a concept that we're mixing the trip helix with the open innovation in cities. It's because at the end of the day, the city is a platform, the city is an organization, we can conquer the university, 
we can help the entrepreneurs to develop a golden reference, to develop and to scale the solution, but to put in the center the citizens, in the center the city challenges. If you know what you need, you will move all the triple helix around you. In terms of economy, I also I will give you the slides, but we were developing the strategy of urban clusters. At the end of the day, it means that we were putting together the different agents of uh, every ecology of innovation. And you will see that we, we put the uh, Pumpo Fabra, the media, uni media uh, university with a media company, uh, Media Pro, the different agents around the media sector are together in the same place. It means that they are sharing infrastructures, they are sharing the different activities that they are doing. The IT and mobile sector is also in the district, but let me show you this slide because you can see how the district is a mix of activities of universities, uh, research, incubators, big corporations, uh, technological center, housing, housing. It means a mix. We are using the city 24 hours, seven days. That's uh, the key uh, point. The energy campus, the health, health cluster, and also the design cluster, the non-technological innovation. We have the tradition of Dali, Gaudi, and Picasso, and it means that we have to work also in this way. After, from 2000, we have now more than 1,500 new companies in the district. The 40% are new, the rest are relocations. Companies that, for instance, Indra was starting with 300 jobs, and now we have 3,000 jobs only for Indra. The number of jobs is about 44, 600 jobs, but if you count the number of real jobs, we have near 90,000. It means that for every knowledge job, we have a service job, people that is working in restaurants, hotels, and so on. Yes, the last slides are about uh, managing the clusters. You will see that in every cluster we have a triple helix organization that is managing the cluster on energy, IT, media, uh, design, and uh, health. And now we are doing cross-sectoral activities, uh, connecting them because we are developing a new part of the district, uh, what we say, the smart city uh, campus. Last message is about social dimension. Uh, the challenge was how to manage the new professionals, the new people that is working and living in the district. It means the associations, uh, uh, the way that we were in dialogue with them is we have breakfast, it means a social capital, it means the interaction with the people, but also including the neighbors. It's about avoiding gentrification. We were including the old people, digital, making digital lives, uh, on also young people studying what we say, the, including in their life, the DNA of 22 Ad. It's about to be knowledge-based, to be entrepreneurial, and to be global. That's the reason why we are allowing them to take advantage of the social elevators. And using the district as a place for growing. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you very much. It's a fascinating presentation and a, a tremendous accomplishment. <laughs> eh? What's that? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, that's what I meant. It, <laughs> it was a great accomplishment, 20 minutes. No, I'm talking about the city of uh, Barcelona. <laughs> Um, you set a high bar for the, our next uh, panelists, but um, if, if everyone holds to the plan, we'll have a chance to comment and maybe for you to make some comments then on the, uh, the other panelists. Um, the next panelist will be Kyle Polk, who is an economic consultant for Detroit Future City, which is in a much earlier stage of having to deal with the transition um, from an industrial city into a new city. So I'm uh, going to turn it over to Kyle now. Do you want the mic? Oh. Uh, that's not this Actually, I'll take that one. I'll take that one. Do you want the Is Jose next? Uh, Jose, is he next? No, that's yeah. fine. I'll just keep it. Um, great. I'm trying to find the right placement here. So I have more to talk about than I have time. And I really, really want to get a QA session going. So I'm going to go by as fast as possible. Um, so hold all questions. Um, this, this picture is hard to see for whatever reason, um, but this is the 1997 Stanley Cup uh, championship team. 
uh, for the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, hockey is arguably the most important sport uh, in the city of Detroit. And this team uh, was all known as the Russian Five. Um, and so uh, this concept of the Wizards of Av is locally what we call them um, because the last uh, two letters of all the team uh, ended in Av. So the, the, the relevance here to the broader conversation is that um, we're talking about innovation and then we're also talking about districts, right? Innovation districts. Um, and there's, there's an important element to that, which is both the ideas and the manifestation of those ideas in a physical place. What those are all uh, manifestations of is uh, coordinated teams. Um, so when we look at teams and, and, and triple helix, and you have to forgive me because uh, the triple helix concept is um, more of something that is a practice that we, uh, that we have done that just happens to be called triple helix and now I'm here. So, um, so as we thought about uh, teams um, and what's going on with Detroit around rebuilding, and there's a whole thread there that we can talk about in the hallway. Um, the teams were important for two reasons. One is ar around a new set of rules. Uh, and the second is around uh, coordinated action. Um, what the team strategy, and, and this, is the, this is the ecosystem of uh, getting things done uh, in a community. Um, and that ranges from uh, the institutions, you could call them the educational and uh, university uh, medical institutions, um, the public sector, which is government, which commissioned the work, um, which I haven't even referred to properly yet, uh, the residents, the, the businesses, the community development, the faith-based organizations, the philanthropic sector, all of these are actors in uh, how you land a physical project. Um, and so, what we did is, and I guess we go back here, is we did a four-year, yeah, four-year strategic planning effort uh, in which the, uh, the ideas for the, the plan, the end plan, uh, came from all these interactions. So there were 163,000 interactions with the community, 70,000 survey responses, 30,000 face-to-face one-on-one conversations. And what that led to is uh, this strategic framework. So this is basically, as I, I said before, the, the playbook for how we move forward and how we land uh, the ideas that we all wanna see. Um, there are two different types of sort of uh, plans that typically exist in urban communities in the US. Vision plans, very grand plans, very pretty pictures, um, but are not rooted in how things actually get done in a community. Uh, master plans, which are actually uh, mandated by the city. Most cities have to have 25 year master plans, heavily politicized um, and, and just not efficient. So this strategic framework is really a hybrid of the two, again, rooted in these conversations. So we take the challenges of the bottom, we take the sort of uh, ideas uh, from the top and we create a plan uh, that works from the middle out. So um, I had the, uh, the honor to work for Michael Porter, uh, Harvard Business School professor, for uh, roughly four years. And so I was working for him as we commissioned this work. Uh, and this work was commissioned by the city of Detroit uh, and local philanthropy in Detroit. And we can talk about how lo local philanthropy is sort of a, a really good alternative financing source other than government administrations. Um, so, the real focus in this plan was, was shifting from a tactical to strategic planning effort. So typically the way that urban economies in the US, again, look at uh, planning is very tactical. It's, it's all about attracting new business, new investments. Um, this plan is about growing existing businesses. Um, largely in urban communities, everyone's fighting for, for the new plant. This is about uh, harvesting the specialization that each community has. And so one community that can attract a semiconductor plant and another community that can attract an assembly plant have fundamentally different specializations. So focusing on the specialization as opposed to the $100 million investment. Um, and again, I'm gonna flip through. This is what came out of four years of work. Consultants from London to Chicago to LA. Uh, this is a 357 page playbook. Um, 
I read it every night. You should too. Um, and the way that it's broken up, and I, I just want to walk through the process. Uh, <laughs> am I okay on time? Uh, it all begins and ends with quality of life. It, the, the, the measurement of success of any plan is around how it raises the quality of life for the people in the community, the business community, the residents, all right? So we start with that being sort of the baseline. And the way that we identify whether or not quality of life has changed is by identifying the realities of today. And I tell you, in Detroit, the realities, uh, at least in the beginning of this process, were, uh, were gloom, gloomy. Um, so we take the community input, okay? Then we have that conversation with the community and understand what are their goals? What are their goals for the future? You know, do they want to see new housing? Do they want to see new jobs? What type of new jobs do they want to see? Do they want to see new infrastructure? What type of new infrastructure do they want to see? Then we anchor those goals in technical analysis. So we have the best infrastructure team from London, the best uh, economic team from Boston. Uh, and, and again, it's anchored in the realities. So that process identified 12 imperatives that came out of the community input in the goals. And those imperatives were around jobs, around population, around what to do with vacant land, around what to do with new infrastructure, uh, it, it, around uh, the challenges of existing health conditions in the community. Um, and this is all important because the, the idea that without uh, community participation, you can create a plan uh, that benefits the community is, uh, is short-sighted at best, at best. Um, so then we said directions, we have strategies, and then we're into this, uh, this planning phase, or the execution of the plan, I should say. I'm gonna spend a very qu quick amount of time about this technical analysis piece. Um, We did a six-month door-to-door uh, land survey. So remember we talked about innovation. Uh, and, and innovation is something that is often housed in universities, the conversation around innovation. But where it lands obviously has to be a physical place. To understand the sort of highest and best use of that physical place, we did a very detailed analysis of land. This is not information that the city had. So for all the communities that are, that are envisioning planning uh, a district without this information, uh, it's important to just know that there's a process that goes along with it. And I'll just run through some of the things that we did. We took the whole city. Uh, we did employment density raster maps or heat maps that tell, that tell you, obviously, the darker, the more jobs there are in that area. We carved out the fat of those jobs and looked where those where the strongest concentration of those jobs lived. And that became the framework for the districts. Okay? Now we have pockets around the city that are sort of uh, the canvases for different types of innovation that can take place. We layer on top of that the infrastructure. This is the trucking uh, uh, network. We layer on top of that the rail. We layer on top of that how many parcels are vacant, how many parcels are underutilized, how many parcels um, uh, are owned by the city, how many are owned by the private sector. And then this is where you get to what companies really want to see. These, uh, these heat maps, I don't know if you can see, but they're different colors. This is dark orange, light dark orange, yellow. They explain how far each parcel of land is from the highway, how far each parcel of land is from a rail spur. Um, and because this is Southwest Detroit, and because Southwest Detroit is on the border with Canada, and this is the Detroit River, um, this area has a very strong logistics cluster. Companies who do just-in-time logistics, I don't know if you all are familiar with, he knows just-in-time logistics. My Amazon guy back there, he knows. Th this is what companies want to know. This is how you sell the, the district to the right type of innovative firm. Ah, five minutes, man. 
All right, then we, then we layer where infrastructure investment is planning to go over the next 20 years, which is already uh, documented. Um, and then we talk about all the great things. So ultimately, the idea of the innovation district is really this puzzle, right? It's the physical land with the opportunity. Uh, and the opportunity uh, is looked at from the facility site requirements, the workforce, uh, the infrastructure. And one of the things that I haven't really touched on is that all of this work is being done on behalf of the mayor's office. The mayor reached out to Dr. Porter's organization and said, we want to understand our land. So all of this is in service to government making better decisions about the type of business they bring in. It's, it's relevant to mention that the decisions that communities make about the type of firms that they, that they recruit or that they grow um, have a distinct impact on labor, okay? If you, if, if, if you recruit more industrial firms, you will have more industrial labor. You will utilize more industrial space. If you recruit more uh, universities and medical uh, facilities, you will have a different workforce. You will have different building needs. And that is only as relevant as what your community looks like today and what you desire for your community to look like tomorrow. But to separate the two is, again, to be short-sighted about the change um, that you seek. My, I got two minutes. So, uh, so the, the, the big piece here is that you plan, you plan, you plan, but what do you do with the plan? This is an example of what we do with the plan. So every year, uh, about 12,000 parcels are auctioned on a website, publicly owned parcels. Um, This is the current state of underutilized land in the city of Detroit. Again, big picture, publicly owned, vacant land, privately owned, underutilized land. What do we do with the land? Well, first we wanna make sure that we understand what we're competitive in. So this is what we call new economy, which is IT design, all right? We are in the second quartile nationally for that type of service. Uh, when it comes to eds and meds, we're in the first quartile. Uh, these are location quotients, which just say per capita how competitive you are. Uh, when it comes to industrial, we're in the first quartile as well. So we want to focus around that. Again, what is the plan? The plan is to take the public, publicly owned land, the underutilized land. Uh, you, you can't see this exactly, but these, these break out different industries and different geographies. Uh, and this is the amount of vacant land in each of those geographies. This is the amount of underutilized land in each of those geographies. And based on employment density, which is something that is very easy to find out, we know the job potential. We know that there are 4,500 jobs possible in uh, this area and that there are 1,600 jobs possible in this area based off what those communities already do. This is how much they make. This is a really good point. This is my last point. So what do we do? So we reached out to Goldman Sachs, in which Michael Porter is on the board, uh, and they have a program focused on uh, providing capital and capacity to small businesses in the city of Detroit. They came to the city of Detroit because we reached out to them. They provided $10 million for small businesses. They have a nine-week, nine-module uh, program, uh, and since October of last year, they've trained uh, over 60 companies. Um, that, is, that is how we create the plan, and you execute on the plan, and you continue to move forward on it uh, until, uh, again, we, we achieve these jobs now. Uh, so I will, I will stop at that and uh, thank everyone for their time and inviting uh, Detroit. And again, Detroit is uh, speaking through uh, for Detroit. We are so appreciative to be involved in this conversation uh, because the challenges that I think all the communities here face are uh, very similar to the challenges that we are faced with. So, thank you. Thanks, Kyle. And um, I'm, I have to apologize to all our speakers for the time limits that we have, but I hopefully that You've said enough to provoke a conversation. 
and uh, more conversations in the hallway. Um, and now we're going to turn to a different problem, which is uh, uh, one that uh, Yossi Ofer will speak about. Is, uh, he's the co-founder of Interlock Development, and his uh, focus will be on uh, how to improve the quality of life for people in smaller areas, in the peripheral areas, in the use of innovation. So good afternoon, and I want to take you from Barcelona and Detroit to some really small towns uh, in the desert. Uh, and you said, rightly so, that it's all global. We're not talking about local, it's all lo global. So if you're talking, for example, in Israel, in some small farming communities in the middle of the desert, they have to go global because that's the, where they make their money from, and they make a lot of money from sending sweet peppers and, and tomatoes to Europe. And they buy with this lot of money that they make, they buy the Toyota cars, and and, and, and uh, houses or vacant lands in Detroit, by the way, as well. So it's all global, okay? So I want to go very, very briefly about the, the, uh, the Israeli ecosystem. I don't want to go uh, deeply into it, just to say that I think we are, it is unique in, in some senses, <coughs> because first of all, the social structure is very important in the, uh, in the Israeli ecosystem, mainly a lot of migration, a lot of immigrants, mainly from uh, Russia or former Soviet Union, and the role of, of uh, social networks uh, developed during the army service, which is mandatory, that are very important. The other thing is the entrepreneurial culture in Israel. People, they like to invent the wheel every day again and again and again. And of course, military technology that is a driver for uh, technological uh, development. And we're doing pretty well. There, there are some, some areas uh, that we excel. We're doing very, very good. But mainly, as you can see, we're doing like most of the developed countries. We're a little bit better here, a little bit better there. <coughs> Excuse me. But the thing is, we're talking about the role of government and the role of local government. So the government is basically playing a key role in optimizing the ecosystem and in translating it into development. And when we're talking about the development, it is of course mainly in peripheral regions or, or secondary cities. And there are three sets of, of, uh, of actions that the government can take. Development of infrastructure in this peripheral or less developed region, so it will be red, the cost will be uh, lower and so on. We have risk sharing, access to money, uh, some financial benefits and incentives and so on. And of course, social goals through some support systems that will enable these uh, communities better access to innovation, entrepreneurships, and, and so on. What have I done? Okay. But the geography of, of innovation is uh, centralized, it's going to the center. If this is the, the map of Israel, if we zoom in into Tel Aviv, you can see that there are more than 70% of the thousands of startups, active startups in Israel now, more than 70% are concentrated here in the center of Tel Aviv. This is less than a square mile, I think. So everything is there. We know that with the incentives and the support, we can push some, some of the innovation, some of the development to the periphery, to the, to the south. So I want to give you an example of what happened to such a small town when this kind of, of uh, innovative development, or, or I don't want to say innovative development, new technologies, high technologies, are pushed to this region. And I'm talking about a small town that is, uh, in Israeli terms, this is periphery. It's about uh, 100 kilometers from, from Tel Aviv. That there is a, a park, an industri industrial and business park with about 400 uh, hectares that created, within 10 years, created more than 5,000 new jobs and now is expanding. And some of the, some of the members in this park are highly uh, known and appreciated, li like HP and mainly Intel which is the main, uh, the main industry there. So this looks like a big success. A small town attracts such 
big and, and impressive uh, uh, technologies and industries. And of course, at national level, it has an immense income. But we're looking at the local impact. What is the local impact? And I'll give you three examples of the local impact. This is a survey made about 10, ten, ten years after the inauguration of the park. And you can see that in this town, the town itself, see this is the level, the rank of the employees. 75% of the local employees are in the lowest level. Minimum wage, catering, cleaning, and, and, and so on. The main central metropolitan areas, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, you see most of the employees are in the two highest level, the engineers, the executives, and, and so on. So this is one thing. The other thing is where these companies, where do they purchase their inputs? And also you can see here that most of the adding value inputs, like the electronic components, financial services, and so on, are purchased from outside. This is the local town, this is the local area, but most of these are purchased from the center of Israel, from Tel Aviv, from Jerusalem, from this area. So this is another, uh, another component that is missed through this. And the last one is where do people, the employees in this park, these 5,000 employees, where do they spend their money? Where do they buy their coffee, supermarket, and so on? And you see that most of them spend less than 10% of their expenditures in the local area. So what happens is that you can see that besides the many, many local taxes that were collected by the municipality, it's a lot of money, okay? What are the results, the social results? If we look at 1996, just the, the year it was established, okay? You see that the socioeconomic ranking of this town was low, four out of 10, okay? 10 is the highest. So after 10 years, it remained the same. If we look at the average income of the, of the workers in this town, after 10 years, 20% lower. It was, it was almost 90% out of the national average, 90% of the, of the national average. 10 years later, it's 70% of the national average. Okay, and the third one is the migration balance, domestic migration balance. People keep leaving the area. Most of them are young. They don't want to live in such an area. Okay, so this is what we call everyone who's involved in international development or local development knows this concept of the leaky bucket. It means that there's a lot of resources going into a local area, but most of them don't stay in the local area. They bounce back or continue to somewhere else. And this is what happens. So the challenge, I think, when we talk about the triple helix in, in this regard of small and remote towns and, and region, the challenge is to keep the benefits local because what happens in main centers, in big centers, you have innovation and you have the impact local. It's concentrating. People are coming to this area and benefiting from it. While in remote area, in secondary centers, the local impact is very small because a lot of it comes back to the center. In, Israel, in the Israeli case, people going to a very, good, a very good university in the south, periphery we talked about in the former uh, panel, very, very good university, but a lot of them, they go back to Tel Aviv. They go back to Tel Aviv or to New York or to London because they get, they get better jobs, better life, better cafes, a better social, social life, and, and so on. So we have to keep this in mind. And today, we are talking about, when we talk about the triple helix model, we talk about the academic innovation, the uh, uh, business innovation. But I think we do not look enough at the innovation in the sphere of government. We, do, we don't look there enough. It's too difficult, maybe, yeah, sure, okay? Why is it so difficult? I think one of the main reasons is because if we look, we have this table and we have here we have inputs and results and here we have quantity and quality. When government, government think and act mainly here, okay? We allocated $1 million for this. 
Okay, it's easy. I did, so I'm the minister or, or whatever. It's very easy to say, I did, I allocated, and it's a lot of money, $1 million. Okay? So, and it's easy to measure. We created, I don't know, five new facilities. We planned, we zoned uh, 2,000 acres. But what happened with this? It doesn't say anything about what happens with this because we want to be here at the qualitative uh, result. What happened with the money? This is what we ask. Okay, you allocated a lot of money. How much well-being was generated? This is what you were, you were asking, okay? How many of the students got a good job here and not in New York or in Tel Aviv? These are the kind of questions that we have to ask, and for government, this is very difficult. So here comes, we're talking about central government and local government. Here comes the role of local government, of course, with the community and civil society. Their, their role is to be able to design, to be partners, to design and to plan this kind of development programs that will ensure that we have this kind of results and then go back to the government and say it's not enough to allocate one million dollars. It has to be allocated like this, for this, and, and so on. So this is the key thing, that this is the key message that, uh, that I want to give. And I think today, when we talk about the triple helix, we are mainly concentrated here. What kind of activities we do here? I think we should look more into what happened in the interface, outside at the local level, okay? And there's a lot of tools that we can use and we use in Israel, for example, municipal capacity building, institutional development of, of municipalities, support systems, technological education, special policies, and so on. There's a lot of tools that we can design and apply together with the communities and with the local authorities. And we, are, we do have some becoming to be good uh, experience in local authorities, in small local authorities, in our uh, desert periphery, in the Negev, and I will give just one small example. Maybe it is simple, but I think it will help us understand. There is, uh, in Israel, and I talked about it in the former panel, military bases are transferred from the center of uh, the country to the periphery. And the government is trying to leverage them for local development. They're doing a lot of efforts and do, they're doing pretty well. So one of the things they did, which is innovative in the eyes of the government, is to allocate each and every local authority that can be affected by this money for strategic planning. Now, what would the local authorities do? They would take the money, they would hire a very slick consultant from Tel Aviv or New York or whatever, he would prepare for them a strategic plan that will never be implemented, of course, because he will do it for them, okay? So what we are doing now with a local institution that I'm working with, what we did, a set of workshops for these local authorities, first of all, to define what kind of results, what kind of results they want to achieve through this strategic planning process. What is the key? What do they want to focus on? And for example, one of these, and again, this relates to what you have said about the zero sum and the, okay, one of the local authorities at the beginning of the process, they said, we want to build some new neighborhoods to attract these beautiful, rich, healthy people from Tel Aviv to come here and stay with us. And at the end of this workshop, he understands that maybe some of them will come, but we need to focus on our weak population and strengthen them and to design a strategic process that will achieve this kind of results. And they could also benefit, of course, from the economic development and so on. So, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you very much. So I think we, with each and every panelist, we get a little more um, ideas that we need to take into account. Um, our next panelist will be Vladimir uh, Klimanov who is the head of and uh, chair of state regulation of the economy, in Moscow. Um, he will, have, I'm sure I have butchered your title so you can correct me. Okay. And, uh, but he is going to talk about the global challenges for the city of Moscow and we're moved back from the periphery
to the center. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, from Russian Academy of National Economy and uh, Public Administration under the president of the Russian Federation. By the way, it's Ranepa. So I'd, I'd like to give some general ideas, uh, vi visions uh, of uh, strategic city development of Moscow, which were collaborated uh, with my colleagues uh, two years ago for Moscow city government. Uh, but you see maybe uh, that Moscow uh, hasn't got uh, own a strategy for social and economic development uh, which uh, is adopted by the government. So we live uh, without any strategy itself. Uh, it's okay. Oh, this one. Just a second. Just ask them the computer. Doesn't work. This one. The slides don't work. No, no, it's the file. File? The file. Okay, I, I'll try to connect uh, without uh, slides mm, because of some technical pr problems. We're struggling with uh, technical difficulties. What would be a session without technical difficulties? Um, we were trying to get the files it's to, position. to work. So, all oh right. Do you want to say a few words without slides? Yeah. Okay. Anyone have any jokes they'd like to tell while we're doing this? All right. Oh, hold on. I try to. Uh, no, no. Oh, yes, okay. Ah, okay. fantastic. All right. I, I should speak uh, any anecdote maybe in the beginning. Uh, by the way, don't you know that in Barcelona city there is a uh, street of Moscow? Don't you know in which uh, district of Barcelona uh, such street can be? Uh, in Olympic Village because uh, uh, Olympic Games in Barcelona will be was uh, uh, after Moscow Olympic Games, and so in Olympic Games uh, village, uh, there are streets of each Olympic centers uh, which were before. So, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give some information uh, about Moscow as a world city and directions of uh, uh, city development for future development of Moscow and then some conclusions about it. Uh, again? Next one. Next. <laughs> I don't know how this. Is it working? No. Next one. Uh, today is a birthday for a host city, Tomsk, and uh, it's not uh, so uh, old as Moscow city. Uh, Moscow city. Um, okay. Um, some general information about Moscow's uh, positioning. Uh, it's, of course, the largest city in Europe, in uh, the post-Soviet uh, countries. And by the way, it's also the biggest att attractor for migrants nowadays, not only from uh, other Russian regions and cities, but also from all countries of post-Soviet uh, 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 countries. And by the way, Moscow is the largest community for billionaires. It's according for Forbes magazine, not, not my estimations. Uh, so it's also a very interesting position of uh, our city. Uh, it's also a famous sports center. Uh, we've got Olympic Games in 1980, and also it's uh, the World Spiritual Center, etc., etc. Some some information about Moscow's history. Uh, a week ago, we've got uh, Moscow City birthday, 
and it was the biggest birthday of uh, Moscow City, which I remember, uh, because uh, we've got uh, uh, 867 years uh, of our history. Moscow nowadays has three UNESCO World Heritage List uh, subjects. Uh, maybe you know only one of them, uh, the Kremlin and the Red Square, uh, but we've got also some two more. And by the way, our Moscow, uh, Lomonosov Moscow State University was founded uh, uh, 100 and more years before Tomsk State University in 1755, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but if we look to Moscow as a world or global city, we can find a very big, uh, very general paradox. Moscow has a very high position on economic or political map in the world, uh, you know it, but uh, according to the quality of life, according to uh, uh, environment, according to some positioning in uh, health, in uh, um, urban uh, space, etc., etc., the position of Moscow is not so high. Uh, according to Economic Intelligence Unit, uh, only uh, in the middle of the list uh, uh, of world cities, uh, Moscow has position on uh, quality of life. So, uh, in this case, we've got uh, s very uh, different uh, challenges uh, and strategic gaps uh, which concerned uh, population, economy, urban space, or environment in the city, and city government. Uh, we've, we can find also very uh, different tendencies in the city development nowadays. Uh, for example, uh, on now we can find a very rapid uh, reducing of manufacturing. Uh, as, as you see, about 20 years or 30 years ago, Moscow was a very industrial city, very manufacturing city. But nowadays, it's without uh, of, many in of many industries in the uh, city center, uh, in the city limits. Uh, but still now, Moscow is the most manufacturing city in Europe. We've got, for example, uh, space and uh, aero production, we've got pharmacy, we've got uh, some food industries, etc., etc. Uh, but uh, we see a rapid reducing of manufacturing. Uh, with this case, we also have uh, an increase of uh, service industries, uh, firstly in financing, in insurance, in uh, trade, uh, con uh, in construction, development, etc., etc., uh, but we've got also uh, not very big, uh, not very large quality of life, not very good of it. So, the uh, city of Moscow needs to adopt a new strategy for city development, and uh, we've got some challenges uh, for this uh, position. Uh, first of one uh, is uh, uh, about reducing of labor force. Uh, according to some estimations, uh, in 20 years or in 15 years, uh, the share of retired persons will be uh, about 30% of city population. Uh, if uh, we look on general trends uh, uh, with uh, natural increase and uh, with uh, nowadays migration. Uh, in this case, uh, we can find a challenge. One, uh, a reduction of labor force, and uh, if we look uh, on this general scheme uh, in which uh, we can find the position of Moscow uh, on the scale between aging city and young city, or city of young, uh, in future, the general trend will be increasing of uh, our old pe persons in the city and position of city will be uh, more aging, <laughs> more elder uh, on this scale. And uh, we can uh, uh, have a, a position a city with more native but uh, retired persons. If we increase migration, we can, uh, of course, uh, get a uh, city more younger, more young, 
uh, but uh, with a lot of migrants. But uh, what kind of these migrants we can find? Uh, they are m mainly not from uh, Moscow suburbs, but uh, from all around uh, the country and f from neighbors uh, countries of Russia. And uh, in this case, uh, um, it's better if they will be students or other creative persons uh, today, nowadays, or f future creative uh, uh, cl class. Uh, sometimes, nowadays, uh, they are migrants for low quality uh, production s s uh, industries like trade or construction or some other else, but not for uh, some uh, industries in high tech industry. Uh, so, uh, it is uh, the first challenge of uh, city development. Uh, if we look to uh, some uh, uh, predictions for industrial structure, uh, we can find that the share of some industries, uh, industries uh, which are uh, most important for city development uh, have a very low position. For example, education is all only 2% of uh, uh, 2.3% of uh, uh, gross regional product uh, gro uh, in Moscow in uh, 2010. And uh, if we have uh, any scenarios for uh, these industries, we can find only 2 or 3 or 4 percent, not more, uh, in a possible future. Uh, of course, we have uh, general reducing of manufacturing in the future also, but a uh, very low position uh, of uh, uh, not only education, but other service industries in, in future. Um, so we've got also another uh, scenario, another challenge for uh, 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 changing in industrial uh, uh, structure. And uh, we should cha uh, change between. Uh, we should challenge between uh, uh, two different positions. How to uh, move this uh, trend to increasing services instead of manufacturing in the city? Uh, of course, in future, Moscow uh, will has uh, will have uh, more uh, services. Uh, uh, in industrial structure, and uh, we uh, can use uh, the capital city's rent because uh, nowadays in Moscow uh, there are very many logistic centers, there are very many uh, industries related to the government one, etc., uh, etc. Et but if we uh, would like to have uh, desirable trends, we should move to high-tech and innovation industries. Uh, but it's a question. You see, for example, uh, Moscow uh, still uh, has, like in Detroit city, uh, automobile industry in the city. Try to find any capital uh, cities in the world which has uh, uh, automobile industry in, in the city. It's a novel, it seems to me. Uh, so some, some experts said that uh, we should renovate industry, uh, manufacturing, general manufacturing in the city. So uh, they uh, say that Moscow must be industrial city in future. Does it, it's strange position, it seems to me. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, also manufacturing production in uh, space, in air cosmic uh, production, in military production uh, for missiles, etc., etc., et for electronics, for electrotechnics, it's also. Uh, but uh, in future, it's desirable to, to move uh, Moscow to more high tech uh, production, of course. Uh, another uh, challenge uh, is uh, connected with uh, city space, environment in the city, etc. On this uh, map uh, of so-called uh, Moscow within uh, old borders, because nowadays the border of city, li uh, city is uh, changed, 
uh, um, we can find that dwellings for persons are located on the periphery of the city, of course, and offices are mainly located in the city uh, center. So we've got a very tr uh, hard traffic jam uh, uh, situation, really, not as in Tomsk city or in other Russian cities. It's collapse of traffic uh, traffics in Moscow. So it's a uh, problem to move uh, uh, offices and other job locations to suburbs, to uh, districts located to uh, city limits, etc., etc. But uh, nowadays uh, there is a, a question uh, how to uh, uh, change uh, city environment, urban environment in this case. Uh, of course, Moscow should increase uh, uh, urban environment standards, and uh, it is general trend. But if we look to this uh, scheme, we can uh, find our desirable uh, trend to uh, move not only to uh, increasing urban environment st standards, but also to diversify city uh, space. Uh, it's a new idea of uh, um, our contemporary Moscow mayor, uh, Mr. Sabianin, who uh, decided to create uh, the longest pedestrian uh, ways in the city, uh, new types of uh, uh, green parks, etc., etc. So it's general desirable uh, trend in this uh, case. And uh, one more uh, challenge uh, for uh, city government. Uh, you see, uh, Moscow is a, the capital city for a very centralized country, really. Uh, and centralization in Russia is in, uh, wo has been increasing during the uh, last 10 years. In this case, the uh, mm, situation in the city itself is the same like in the country. Uh, uh, and uh, de uh, decisions uh, are made uh, mainly in the city government itself, but not in local communities within cities. Uh, so we should make uh, uh, the process uh, which is more decentralized, more uh, uh, move, move, moved to uh, local communities. Uh, it's our desirable position. Uh, so it's also a new challenge for Moscow city development using uh, by government. Uh, in conclusions, I'd like to give general information about these ideas. So you see, Moscow is really uh, a global city involved in uh, very different world uh, processes. Is, uh, Moscow is a global city, and it will be in future, of course, a uh, global city. Uh, but Moscow needs the new strategy, and nobody knows uh, which kind of uh, strategy must be uh, for such big, uh, such uh, <laughs> different uh, uh, city. Uh, there is a hard choice in front of Moscow city government to develop the city because uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, external uh, directions for the city. Uh, by the way, for example, uh, high schools in Russia are under responsibilities of the federal government, but not for city governments. So uh, more than 200 universities uh, in uh, the city of Moscow, uh, which are 100 of them are city, uh, are, uh, state uh, universities. Uh, these universities are under federal government, federal authorities, federal ministry of education and other federal ministers, but not from, uh, under uh, of city government. So, so th there is a very hard choice to Moscow city government to develop the city uh, with a lot of uh, external uh, positions of, of it. And uh, the list of Moscow's development opportunities has a lot of limitations because uh, we've got a very uh, strong legacy for uh, manufacturing, for former development of the city, for traffics, etc., etc. But I hope that Moscow will be the 
very best city in the world, really. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think what we've seen through all the panelists is a variety of different kinds of challenges, but uh, I think a consensus on the necessity of involving uh, not only having the welfare of the population involved uh, in mind, but the involvement of them in the process itself is a critical element. Now, we have about 15 minutes, and we want to use that for a few comments among the panelists and then for comments from you. So hopefully uh, we can make some um, more productive use of the remaining few minutes. I, th I know Joseph has some comments. Yes, uh, let me add, because uh, when we talk about the industrial activities, perhaps we think in the last uh, industrial activities, but now Europe uh, is uh, understanding the opportunity to the reindustrialization of Europe, taking advantage of the new technologies like printing 3D and all the, all the, all the new opportunities that we'll have in the value chain of the industrial activities. We will have the designs in the cloud and we will print on demand in a very local way. It means that we have the cities a, an opportunity, but not thinking to put the factory of China in the city of Barcelona. This is no way. The, the challenge is how can we design concepts in Barcelona that we put in the cloud and we have the printers, of uh, the new printers, you know, the 3D, 3D printers, and now we're starting, and uh, we have a work, uh, starting to print not just materials, also bio printing. We are printing food, we are printing f uh, different concepts that until now it was not existing. It means that the reindustrialization thinking in the future, it's a, it's a big opportunity. Uh, and second, about mobility. Uh, when, when you see what a city needs, it's a ways, is how to manage the energy, Remember that the best energy is the no energy. If you are not using the energy, it's the best way. The best mobility is the no mobility. And the no mobility you can do two ways. Uh, in a walking distance, if you're living and working in a very close place, or working in the cloud. If you're working in the cloud, you can live anywhere. It means that if the people cannot, you, you can move when you need a, mo a meeting. But if not, why not you're working at, at home or near your home? It means that Perhaps a, a good solution is to have like home platform or work platforms for workforce that is working uh, because I am sure they are working with uh, San Francisco or with China. It's not about the hour. It, what I mean is that these kind of solutions are in the mind of the new generation of the new digital generation that is yet in the cloud. They are in the cloud. It means that the mobility and this kind of problems, we have to think not just the old problems with old solutions is the new problems or the old problems but with the new new solutions. I, I'd like to, for uh, Yossi and Joseph, I, um, because I'm mildly familiar with your communities, I think there's an interesting connection between uh, um, what people would call old Detroit and new Detroit. Old Detroit, old Detroit. and new Detroit. And I think the same will happen for you all. I think you will have very hyper-local communities in which foreign investment and new people is sort of met with a level of resistance, especially Catalonians. So uh, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts about how communities can be more open to embracing, uh, whether it be jobs or whether it be uh, uh, immigrants. I think w when I'm talking at these communities, I don't think there's a fear in these communities. Uh, I think there's a, a matter of, of trust. The thing is trust. They feel that they were neglected by, by the state, by, uh, by, uh, by, by the, the industries. So I think the best way, and I think you can relate to this, is to build these small, to develop these very small uh, successes, okay? To work and slowly build trust and increase the level of partnerships and, and grow it from, from within, you know, very slowly. In the case of Barcelona, uh, we, we speak about 170 languages in Barcelona. 
it's it's wonderful. It's incredible because I mean we have assets of the world living in Barcelona. That is a, an incredible opportunity. It's about talent. If you want to go to China, if you are not including a Chinese people in your team, believe me, it's very complicated. It means that the people, uh, the global people in your cities uh, are global ambassadors. That's the reason why I am going uh, to the world, I am coming back to the local. Nothing is local. And I love that the Chinese people is eating Chinese food and I can eat also Chinese food. This is another approach. It's not about how can I preserve my culture. I can I have an heritage as a tradition, and we are in Barcelona, but we have we have to allow to be global citizens the way they way they want. In this case, uh, when we were doing the transformation of 22 Ad, we were worried about the gentrification. Worry because you know you know now in San Francisco the Google boys. Uh, decide to live not in San Jose, they decide to live in San Francisco. And they're increasing the price of the rent uh, in the flats of San Francisco. And they pay $3,000 for a small flat. And the people that were living before in San Francisco, they have to go out. This is gentrification. The way that we were avoiding that is that we put in the formula, in the solution, social housing. Social housing that is coming from the real estate developers, when they, they are increasing the floor, they give us the 30% of the land, the 10% of this land we put in hands of the neighborhoods. They have to build the buildings. Uh, this is, they, we, we live, uh, we loan the, uh, really we give the land for 50 years, but they cannot sell. It means that it's a good way to include them in the process. but. The formula is not only about housing, it's not only about old people, it's about new generation, the young people. Because they are young, and when a child is 10 years old, in only two mandates, in eight years, he or she will choose what studies they, uh, they, they will start. If they will be engineering, if they will be uh, health or wh whatever. That is a big infrastructure. That if we believe that the talent is the raw material of the knowledge-based economy, but only of the knowledge-based society. This is about both sides. Education is an infrastructure. And that's the reason why we are working with all the schools. And believe me that the people is, are coming from different places, with uh, parents without studies, or with parents with, with studies. And you know that with your parent, your father's, uh, your parents are, um, with the studies, it's very easy that you will uh, study a PhD or whatever. If your father, the reference, the close reference is not with higher studies, you have to find another reference. That's the reason why we connect very fast the schools with the companies, the schools with the universities. This is also very, very important. The gentrification is not just a short-term gentrification. It's that imagine that they are working in Barcelona, they see Telefonica and they say, I will never work here. This is, this is, this is cannot possible. This is the, the thing that we want to avoid. But you have to create not just the opportunity, because uh, Europe is providing opportunities in terms of education, the aspirations. It's about aspiration. If you don't know what to be in the future, you will not be never, uh, what, because you, are, you don't. That's the, the, pro the connection with the dreaming, uh, with what you can do. Thank you. Did you want to comment? Yeah, maybe. Uh, you see, uh, I agree with you about uh, the future of uh, reindustrialization, but uh, it seems to me it's possible mainly for uh, Moscow suburbs, not the city center. Uh, and nowadays we've got an uh, um, industrial boom uh, in Moscow suburbs uh, because uh, they, mm, some enterprises move uh, there from the city center and from other Russian regions, really. Uh, and about uh, migration and mobility in Russia. You see, it's a very interesting situation in my country uh, because the main value for uh, Russians, for, for me also, is uh, the dwelling, is uh, apartment itself, but not a job like in many uh, other European and countries and in the United States. So uh, the main uh, idea for many Russians 
to uh, get new flat, new apartment in Moscow or, or in suburbs of, of Moscow. Ask anybody on the streets. Uh, they, and uh, they uh, don't, don't think about uh, job itself. So it's strange positions for Europeans and Americans. So mobility in Russia I is not the same like in the United States, for example, and in the European Union also. Uh, by the way, uh, it seems to me that uh, different cities are close uh, to each other. Uh, we've got the same problems, <laughs> small cities or big cities. Uh, if we we'll, uh, create, yeah, may oh, maybe, yeah. But the way, uh, we've got also, you see, uh, we've got a joke about uh, Moscow mobility because Moscow is a transition way uh, from uh, Russian regions to other world cities because in Moscow uh, pe people uh, won't uh, go only abroad but not to any other Russian cities, you see. But uh, Moscow is the largest attractor for migrants uh, nowadays in Russia. So it's uh, not the same case uh, for <laughs> small uh, localities in I I Israel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have two or three minutes. I have one piece of housekeeping to do before we let you go. But before that, if anyone from the audience has a very short comment or question, please. Uh, so, Alexei Kuzmin, uh, Center for Urban Research of Tom State University. Uh, we are speaking uh, about uh, transforming of uh, our city, and uh, also we are speaking about uh, innovation in the city and new economy, etc., etc. But uh, in our cities, we have also old people, not elder, but with old mentality, with uh, old skills, uh, with uh, industrial skills. Uh, who worked uh, on industrial place? Uh, I don't know what I what I am talking about. So, uh, and uh, the problem and the question is, uh, what can we suggest for these people? Uh, how can we involve uh, them uh, for new activity? Because uh, mostly they uh, uh, they can't uh, learn new skills. Uh, they can't understand new economy, and uh, for them, uh, the main value is industrial um, working. So, and uh, the question: uh, uh, How we can, or uh, maybe uh, can we transform these people, and uh, what should we do? Thank you. And we were connecting all the old people with the young people, developing what we say the digital memories. We put the old people in the cloud, but with an inter intergenerational di dialogue. It means that the young people were understanding that old people also were immigrants, but in another generation. And really, we were very happy because now these old people is living in the car also. They have the memories, they have the Skype to call, to speak mm -hmm. with their families. They have, it means that in terms of digitalization, at, at the end of the day, technology is, is, uh, at the end, is an expression of cultural aspect. And the technology that the mobile is providing to any person is changing also the mind of the old people. My suggestion to you, is a dialogue intergeneration because the, the child, they are in the cloud, they are digital. The problem is that we are immigrants, digital immigration, <laughs> and we need to be sure that they are connected with their lives. If you put their lives in the, in the cloud, I am sure that they will be closer to, to this new society and, and economy. This is the, what we are doing and we were very happy. Awesome. Yeah. Just uh, another idea, I, I totally agree with this, but also another agree is we've seen that the world is uh, aging, so it's a huge growing market, right? Yeah. So maybe for some of the industries in Tomsk to work with this elderly on designing new products or, or, or new things, that will open new markets for the businesses in Tomsk. I totally agree with that statement. Is It's important to recognize that um, that community, that population, that demographic, they're not going 
anywhere. So if you don't create opportunities for them, uh, it doesn't solve the problem. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so it's it's not a it's not a uh, high tech or low tech. It's and it's just about how much you provide opportunities for high tech and how much you provide opportunities for older generations or uh, older skill sets. But uh, one one hundred percent. Okay, so we have one more comment, and then uh, I have one announcement to make. I wanted to comment about this debate of scale of the um, uh, region and the district. Uh, there is a, uh, an interesting debate which I've heard about the universities. There are big universities and small universities. And the two rectors, one from the big university, the other from the small university, were discussing whether to involve the faculty members into wider discussions about the development of the universities. Of course, the rector of the small university was arguing that you have to involve as many people as possible because this is, everything is transparent and you have to include everybody in decision making. The other one was saying, come on, that depends on the quality of the society, of the community, because the questions, uh, the, the quality and the capabilities of the uh, local audience has to be equal to the problems which have to be solved together. Uh, my personal experience in a house where about 100 families lived, we tried to discuss together what to do, and it was a nightmare, <laughs> because everybody wanted to say something, to bring its piece of something into the discussion, and nothing went through from this discussion until a small group of the, uh, like Russian venture company calls us, the leaders of change, have appeared, discussed it, really suggested the way, and used this uh, local uh, meeting as, a, as an instrument of legitimation of this. And uh, the question of the older people, I was involved in the project which was called Best Agers. That was the project about how to keep the elderly people in the economics. It was the EU project and various, various different forms of how to keep them and how to get them involved. But I like very much your approach when you said that it's project approach. So do not uh, try to solve every problem as a systematic uh, solution for everything. Try to take one thing to create uh, one community which would be working instrument. And then best experience will help the other cases to be solved. And that sometimes you need a lot of people to be involved. Sometimes you can uh, use them as the instrument of legitimation of your solution. That's the same for the universities. Let's bring together the management of the universities in Russia as a public institution and the management of the city or of the municipality or of any other public sponsored uh, institution in this country. That's why I think that the concept which we are discussing uh, is very, very uh, useful for very many different uh, elements of our societal development. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that comment. I think that's a great uh, comment to uh, bring our session to a close because while uh, we've raised many problems and um, I don't think we've solved them. It gives us a reason to get together again to continue this kind of dialogue and in the spirit uh, that you, uh, that you uh, uh, spoke about and using the instrument of the um, triple helix to solve real problems and to uh, increase the dialogue among all of us uh, in the future. So um, in closing, I have been given the honor from the uh, organizing committee to uh, present our plaque of appreciation to our keynote speaker and our chief problem solver, uh, Joseph Piquet. So I want to thank you uh, for your contributions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, there we go. I don't know if there's anybody to take a picture. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, um, now, who, who knows what we're doing next? <laughs> I believe we have a, Leanna, what? Yeah? All right. All right, we have 15 minutes break before the closing ceremonies.